every Sunday, I go to Holy Cathedral, Holy Trinity Cathedral to light a candle in memory of my parents and grandparents. Then I go to the community center next door where I volunteer at the fellowship bookstore there. The big suspense of the day is, will I make the 1.48 p.m. train out of Grand Central or have to wait an extra hour for the next train? At home, I will find out what damage my two cats, Teddy Bear and Smokey, have done to each other and the house. This past Sunday was magic. Maybe because it is football season, the community center empties quickly. We were able to put all the books away and religious items promptly and balance the books in time for me to be at Grand Central 25 minutes before the 148 train departure. I love the beauty of Grand Central Station. God bless the memory of Jackie Kenny Onassis for saving it from the wrecking ball. For some reason, it does my heart good to see people busily going and coming from different places. I was contemplating whether I should make an investment in a Starbucks coffee when my attention was drawn to a rapid, authoritative clicking on the marble floor. A tall woman with striking looks was quickly approaching in my direction wearing stiletto heels. She walked like she owned the place. She had on a navy blue pantsuit outfit, including the same color cap, a white blouse, and a red scarf. She was rolling smoothly behind her piggyback style, olive green colored luggage, with one hand craving a matching carry-all bag in the crook of her elbow, while still holding a container of coffee, revealing a gold and gem studded bracelet wrist. My mind was made up then to have that coffee. Just as she was going by me, I heard a loud snap above the terminal's din. She had broken her right heel. Things happened fast. She was going down head first to that unforgiving stone floor. Instinctively, I made a grab for her. It turned out to be both a lucky and a proper grab. I had both my hands right above her hips as I braced myself to hoist the straight. And I didn't touch any of the naughty bits, as Marty Python would have said. <laughs> we were eye to eye, and I could see that her hair and makeup was askew. Are you all right? I asked in the calmest voice possible, hoping that that would be helpful. I guided her to the wall next to the train gates so that she could get some support. Her composure seemed to be returning a bit, and she nodded. I retrieved a cap and two pieces of luggage that had tumbled and became disengaged. The coffee had become a brownish puddle, but providently it hadn't splashed anyone. I turned my attention to the lady to have a recheck if she was injured in any way. She moved the right foot gingerly, but without grimacing. She was able to put on stylish looking flat shoes gotten from the luggage. She straightened up with a smile and explained, my, that was quick, pointing behind me to the station maintenance man that arrived in the electric golf court. They had already placed plastic yellow warning red floor signs as they speedily mopped up the spilled coffee. Oh, this place is filled with cameras, especially after 9-11. There are many eyes watching, I explained. She didn't seem pleased with that information. Well, I hope my grand entrance from Boston doesn't end up on that rhymes of the ancient Mariner YouTube thing. <laughs> I was so preoccupied with making the train to Chappaqua to see my new son's home. I should have worn sensible walking shoes. I hope I don't miss my train, she said wistfully. I'm taking the same train and going two stops further, north to Bedford Hills, I added, and we still have time. It is gate number 112 on the lower level. I also offered. If you're sure you're not hurt, let's go. I can pull the luggage. Lead on, McDuff. She replied with spirit. She did walk with the slightest of limps. Settling in on the train, I noticed that we still had 15 minutes till departure. I was going to get a cup of coffee for myself, and we still have time. Let me know how you like yours. It is a 50-minute ride to Chappaqua. She gave me very in explicit instructions and offered to pay. I couldn't resist. I never take money from a fallen woman. 
She giggled. I returned with five minutes to spare. She had freshened her hair and makeup. Oh, by the way, my name is Margaret, and the coffee hits the spot. I'm Nick. You made small talk, but she kept going back to her misstep at Grand Central Station. I can't believe I was so clumsy. I was enthralled with her theatrical voice, just like my wife Joanne's, who is now visiting relatives in Greece. I tried to be comforting. You know, when you think of it, you did something quite remarkable. She looked at me puzzled. I mean, you went from Cleopatra to Quasimodo in no time. She chuckled with mock horror. I was on a roll, or if you prefer. You went from Ginger Rogers to Captain Ahab in a second. She had a nice full laugh, just like my Joanne's. You have to do me a favor, I asked. I come from Brooklyn. I mean, where else is it? Can you pronounce wish the sire sauce for me? <laughs> My wife can, but obviously I can't. She had to use the ladies' room. When she returned, she was still teary for laughing. Before church, I always buy two large sugarless scones from Cinderella's on East 75th Street to share with Joanne. Margaret accepted Joanne's. It was Camelot until we waved our goodbyes at Chapel Thank you.